God bless you. My name is Pastor Harris Kekalides, and you're watching and reading the program, Gain to Know Jesus. And today we're going to talk about the fall of Babylon. Verse 8 of Revelation 14 says, The New Testament in the language of today. It says, A second angel followed him. She has fallen, he said. The great Babylon has fallen. She who made all the nations drink of the wine of her immoral passion. And today we're going to study Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. An angel announcing the fall of Babylon. The scripture says the following. And another angel following saying, Babylon is falling, is falling, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. In verse 6, we saw an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach. And we, and we covered verses 6 and 7. Now we will see another angel giving the message that Babylon is falling. Babylon is falling, is falling, that great city. The Jews had a habit to repeat their sayings if it is important, as we have the habit of underlining, writing it in big letters, or putting comma, commas, something, but when we see something that we think is important, and we know something is important, we put commas, we put, we put, we, we highlight it, we, we darken it, we, we do a whole bunch of stuff. But the Jews had the habit of repeating it. So this angel repeated himself, it's falling, it's falling, talking about Babylon, to show this is important. We're going to see some examples of um, the Old Testament when it repeats himself. Now 1 verse 2, God is jealous and the Lord avenged. The Lord avenged and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. Notice the repetition because it's important. Exodus 34 verse 14. For you shall worship no other God for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Psalms 94 verse 1. O Lord God to whom vengeance belongs. O God to whom vengeance belongs. Shine forth. <clears throat> Next we see because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Her fornication, many times in scripture, fornication is speaking about idols. Other times it speaks about sexual immorality. A good percentage of the scripture talks about fornication speaking about idol worship. Leviticus 17 verse 7, They shall no more offer their sacrifice to demons after whom they have played the harlot. This shall be a statue forever for them throughout their generation. Leviticus 20 verse 5 <clears throat> Then I will set my face against that man and against his family and I will cut him off from his people and all who prostitute themselves with him to commit hauchery with Molech. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 21 verse 11 Moreover he made high places in the mountains of Judah and caused the inhabitants of Jerusalem to commit hauchery and led Judah astray. Second Chronicles 21:13. But have walked in the way of the kings of Israel, and have made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to play the harlot, harlot, like the harlot of the house of Ahab, and also have killed your brothers and those your father's household who were better than yourselves. So I want you to notice that most of it speaks about harlotry, prostitution and fornication and is all referring to idol worship. Why is it that? Because the believer is supposedly promised to God. He's married to God. God is their husband. Jesus is their bridegroom. The church is the bride. So when the church goes whoring, then it's fornicating, it's adultering, it's prostituting. Okay. The following, I will now quote some quotation from the early church fathers showing that the Roman Catholic Church is that. I've heard lots of people talk about Mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon is Rome. 
is not Iraq. People are looking at Iraq. It's called Mystery Babylon because it's a mystery. If it was Iraq, then it wouldn't be a mystery. What makes it a mystery is that it's pretending to be Christianity when it's not. Mystery Babylon is the Vatican City that made covenants with many people. Early church fathers understood that Rome was Mystery Babylon. Ha example, Tertullian, he states, the reference is on the screen. So again, Babylon in our own John is a figure of the city Rome as being equally great and proud in her sway and triumphed over the states. Tertullian, he knew who was Mr. Babylon and what was Mr. Babylon and he states it was Rome. Eusebius states and Peter makes mention of Mark in his first epistle which they say that he wrote in Rome itself as it indicated by him when he calls the city by a figure of Babylon. Victorinius states in his commentary Apocalypse of the Blessed John he states and I saw it the woman herself sitting upon the scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy is is full of names of blasphemy why because they're calling a man the names of God but to sit upon the scarlet beast the author of the murders is the image of the devil wherefore also is treated of his captivity concerning which we have fully concern consider I remember indeed that this is called Babylon also in the apocalypse on account of the confusion and in Isaiah also Ezekiel calls it Saddam in fine if you compare what is said against Saddam and what Isaiah says against Babylon and what the apocalypse says you will find that they are all one the seven heads are the seven hills on which the woman sitteth this is the city of Rome already poet three church fathers the Vatican's Rome is mystery Babylon now I'm gonna quote Jerome he states in a letter he says, for Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitations of devils, and behold, of every foul spirit. It is true that Rome has a holy church, trophies of apostles and martyrs, a, a true confession of Christ at that time. They had all these things. The faith has been preached there by an apostle. Heathenism has been trodden down. The name of Christian is daily exalted higher and higher, but the display, power, and size of the city, the seeing and the being seen, the paying and the receiving of visits, the alternate flattery and distraction, talking and listening, as well as the necessary of facing so great a throng even when one is least in the mood to do so. All these things are alike foreign to the principles and fatal to the repose of the monastic life. But when people come in our way, we either see them coming and are compelled to speak, or we do not see them and lay ourselves open to the charge of hauntiness. But I want you to notice Jerome also thought it to be the city of Rome. Mystery Babylon is the city of Rome. As long as one accepts Benedict XVI's new religion, or accepts Benedict XVI and his apostate bishops as Catholics, while they teach that Jesus Christ and the Catholic faith are meaningless, it is predicted in Catholic prophecy that in the final days there will be a massive apostasy from the Catholic faith from the city of Rome itself. This is because it comes from anti-popes who are posing as true popes and who have created a counterfeit sect.
Our Lady of La Salette, France, September 19, 1846, quote, Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. The church will be in eclipse. Our Lady of La Salette tells us that Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist, and that the church will be in eclipse. This coincides with the prophecies in sacred scripture, Apocalypse 17 and 18, that the city of seven hills, Rome, will become a harlot. The great harlot prophesied in the Bible is not the Catholic Church. It is the counterfeit Catholic Church, the Vatican II sect, the apostate phony bride, which arises in the last days to deceive Catholics and eclipse the true church which has been reduced to a remnant. We can see that Our Lady's message at La Salette, France has been fulfilled before our very eyes. Benedict XVI and the Vatican II sect teach that Jews are perfectly free not to believe in Jesus Christ. This is published in Benedict XVI and the Vatican's own books. It proves that Rome has become the seat of the Antichrist. Our Lord also indicates in the last days there will be the abomination of desolation in the holy place, Matthew 24, 15. He tells us that there will be a deception so profound that if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. He even asks if there will be any faith left on earth. Luke 18, verse 8, quote, But yet the Son of Man, when he cometh, shall he find, think you, faith on earth. This deception will happen in the very heart of the church's physical structures, in the temple of God, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4, and the holy place, Matthew 24, 15 and will arise because people receive not the love of the truth. God allows this as the supreme punishment for the world's sins. We are currently living through this apostasy and deception. People need to completely reject Antipope Benedict XVI, the New Mass, and the new apostate Vatican II religion. 1969, Paul VI replaced the traditional Latin Mass in Vatican II churches with his own creation, the New Mass, or Novus Ordo. Since that time, the world has seen the following in the Vatican II churches, which celebrate the New Mass, or Novus Ordo. The world has seen clown masses in which the, quote, priest dresses as a clown in utter mockery of God. The world has seen priests dress as Dracula in football jerseys accompanied by cheerleaders as a cheesehead. There have been disco masses, Gymnastic performances during the New Mass, balloon masses, carnival masses, nude masses, at which scantily clad or nude people take part, and we have seen juggling masses at which a juggler performs during the New Mass. The world has seen priests celebrate the New Mass with Dorito chips, with Mountain Dew, on a cardboard box, with cookies, with Chinese tea accompanied by ancestor worship, with a basketball as a priest bounces it all over the altar, with a guitar as the priest plays a solo performance. The world has witnessed the new mass with a priest almost totally nude as he dances around the altar, with priests dressed in native pagan costumes, with a Jewish menorah placed on the altar, with a statue of Buddha on the altar, with nuns making offerings to female goddesses, with lectors and gift bearers dressed up as voodoo Satanists, the world has seen the new mass at which the performer is dressed up in a tuxedo and tells jokes. The world has seen rock concerts at the new mass, guitar and polka new masses, a puppet new mass, a new mass where the people gather around the altar dressed as devils, a new mass where people perform lewd dances to the beat of a steel drum band. The world has seen a new mass where nuns dressed as pagan vestal virgins make pagan offerings. The world has also seen new masses incorporating every false religion. There have been Buddhist new masses, Hindu and Muslim new masses, new masses where Jews and Unitarians offer candles to false gods. There are churches where the entire congregation says the mass with the priest, where the priest sometimes talks to the people instead of saying mass. What we have cataloged is just a tiny sampling of the kind of thing that occurs in every diocese in the world where the new mass is celebrated. To one the, the Pope is trying to uh, get people to realize the problems that they have are individually superficial and that a more of a greater worldview should be more expressed. The 
Pope's main drive, I think, um, today is uh, we would like world peace and I think, you know, one ultimate religion. In 1986, at Assisi, Italy, Pope John Paul invited 130 leaders of the world's major religions to join together to pray for peace. This World Day of Prayer for Peace, to which you have come from many parts of the world, kindly accepting our invitation. Praying together were Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, witch doctors, and even spiritists. The Pope has aggressively sought common ground and unity between people of all faiths. The Bible also alludes to the leadership of the city of Rome, especially in an ecclesiastical sense, and the rise of the Vatican in a role to be a leader of an ecumenical movement sounds absurd. If you've studied the narrowness and the, folk and the conservativeness, if you will, of, of Catholicism over the last 1,000, 1,500 years, what have you, to predict that Rome would be a leader in the New Age sense or in the pantheistic sense sounds manifestly absurd. And yet, as we watch day to day, the Vatican embracing evolution, you've got to be kidding. And there it is. So the point is, the more you study these major themes in the Bible, and the more you take the trouble to try to get the horizon, the world horizon in perspective, the more it seems we are heading right into that period that the Bible has so much to say about. And of course, all of this climaxes with this bizarre idea that Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe that became man and fulfilled a destiny on our behalf, is going to return to straighten this mess out. Verse 8. The second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Literal Babylon took Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, removed the vessels, and put the people in bondage for 70 years. The papal hierarchy, through its perversion of the church, took away the true worship and put the people in spiritual bondage for 1260 years. The reformers ended the bondage, but did not destroy the papal system any more than freeing Israel from Egypt destroyed Egypt. Now he speaks of the... Snyder had an interview with a Catholic priest, and that Catholic priest said, I am a Hindu. Brian said to him, his name is Patrick, do you have to be a Roman Catholic to go to heaven? And the priest answered, that, 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 that there is no reason whether I'm a Catholic or whether he's a Hindu or whether he's a Muslim, whether he's a this thing. That God has given to each one his own. In that church, we have the burial place of one of Rome's saints, Catherine of Siena. Buried there, there's a painting that depicts her in her supposed glory, which depicts the the doctrine of sainthood in the Roman Catholic Church, that certain specially holy people become saints and are literally glorified uh, by the Roman Catholic Church. They're pronounced saints by the Pope. And there, St. Catherine is depicted uh, with her feet over all of Europe. She's a patron saint of Europe. And uh, surrounded by angels, glorified literally. Rome got its doctrine of Mary from the pagan religions. It's very obvious. There's nothing in the Bible about Mary being the queen of heaven. Nothing in the Bible, not a hint that we should pray to Mary. Not a hint that Jesus is to perpetually be a little baby. Not a hint that Mary is a perpetual virgin or anything like that. Where did these doctrines come from? Not from the Bible, but from pagan religions. Many ancient pagan religions had similar doctrines to that that Rome has of Mary today, like Isis. She's depicted as holding her little baby, God, Horus. This picture was taken in uh, Europe in a museum that we visited in Europe a few years ago. And here's Mary with her little baby. She's also crowned. In the Vatican Library, there's a painting of Isis, clothed in blue, 
looking almost exactly like the depiction of Mary that we see in this, in this Catholic church. Crowned with the crown. In Rome, you see many of the confessionals. And many of them are in operation when the priest is... Reject the Father. If you reject me, you are rejecting the Father. But yet you say they can still have a relationship with God. Based upon what? Just the fact that people do have relationships in God. And people do pray. Muslims pray frequently. Buddhists pray. Yes. So in your opinion, if you pray, you must have a relationship with God. Yeah. Okay. Could I... Uh, Praying to God. Could I move on to maybe a, a different topic? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, because yeah, fundamentally... Okay, unless you have some... Uh, in, in my opinion, <coughs> it really isn't my task to say who's in heaven and who isn't. You know, that's a judgment that some preachers love to say, this person's in hell and this one's in heaven. That's God's job. My job is to talk about the Scripture, to preach what God has revealed, but not in that incredibly judgmental way of dividing up peoples and cultures. Okay, mm -hmm. before we go to the next topic, I, I, I just have a few questions in my mind. Um, now, you believe that the Bible is the Word of God, mm -hmm. and so you would not disagree with what the Bible has to say. Is that true? Well, there it depends. You have to interpret the Bible. Okay, but I mean, and if it's uh, something clean plain and clear, well, like you must be born again or you cannot enter the kingdom of God, something like that. Would you agree with that? Depends how literally you're going to take it. I'm not going to agree with it if you're going to say that no non-Christian or non-Catholic can be saved. Okay, then. Anyway, with that, with that said, um, now you know the fall of man, Adam and Eve sin, and mm -hmm. we were all born, would you agree we're all born sinners? We're all born with a sin nature, which is the reason Christ died. Well, I mean, that, that is in the Bible. That's what it says, that, that uh, the fall of man, that sin entered the wor world through Adam and has passed on to all mankind. So we all have a sin nature, and, and that is the re whole reason. No, so we're that's separated. where I disagree with Luther in the, in the 15th, 16th century. Man is fundamentally good as he comes from the hands of but, God. But in Romans, it says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, Okay, so There's you don't agree with sin. that. Okay, you don't agree that all men are, are born sinners? We're born influenced by sin because of the world. That's what we my original sin. Then why did Christ die? To fight against For that and forgive our personal sins, right. I mean, he's, he said, I, I've taken on the sins of the world. Right. He's talking about our, sin, our, our sins that we're born with, right? No, he's talking primarily about the sins that we, the choices we make. Okay. What I would call personal sin. Right. They used to put the sins on the lambs, and it was, of course, a foreshadowing of the Messiah. You do believe that God in the flesh, Jesus, it, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He, he lived a perfect life and died on the mm -hmm. cross for the sins of men and rose from the dead. And whoever would receive him it, it has the right to become a son of God. That, that's what first John, I mean, that's what a, a, you know, first chapter of John says. So would you agree with that? That, that, whoever, yeah. that whoever receives him has the right to become a son of God, then that would uh, logically mean that whoever rejects him does not have a right to, um, to be a son Disagree. of God. Disagree. Okay. Because okay. that assumes that they've heard of him. Many have not heard of him. And you're condemning to hell but, okay. all those well, what I'm saying millions is, of people who have never heard of him. Well, Jesus let's Christ. say you're an Islam, uh, Islam, you worship Allah, which, uh, as we know, Muhammad... Uh, picked him out of 300 demon gods, and he has different characteristics than Jehovah God of the Bible. They're worshiping a false god. They think Jesus Christ is a prophet. And we tell them, Jesus Christ is not a prophet. He is God in the flesh. He's the Messiah. And if you'll turn your life to him, you'll have eternal life. And they say, no, I don't want that. What happens to those guys? What would happen? Depending to how they live their life. If they live a good life, they'll still go to heaven? Sure. Okay. Just wanted to clear that up. <clears throat> I'd like to, uh, to ask... This is the inside of St. Simon's Chapel. The pilgrims come from far and wide, and many seem to have traveled here from the capital of Guatemala City. Candles, as in many Catholic pilgrimage sites. But the saint is a bit odd. A store window dummy dressed as a mighty Spanish ranchero with tie, sombrero, and a staff. On his knees and in his left hand, a roll of bills. 
and then Indian women smoking tobacco in some kind of ritual. They snap their fingers and knock to attract the saint's attention. Votive plaques on the walls all around us, all thanking Saint Simon for his miraculous doings. But the saint being worshipped here is actually an old Indian deity, Maximon. People walk away from him backwards. And here, all the way over on the side in the glass cabinet, the Christian Saint Simon, the carpenter. The Catholic Church has simply adopted a heathen cult to worship a Christian saint. This makes the saint a witness to some rather unusual rituals. It was not until the 4th century that the Church of Rome identified December 25th with the birth of Christ. But once the date was officially set by Rome, devoted missionaries carried it along with the gospel beyond the borders of the known world. New religion. That was a great day, Gunther. In spite of the snow and the howling of wolves, it was a moving ceremony, Father. My people love the story of the manger. Especially the little ones. Then they can all better understand why we observe Christmas. But, Father, how am I to stop my people from celebrating Yule and worshiping the fir tree? Don't worry, Gunther. To your people, the fir tree and the holly mean eternal life because they're always green. Yes, and Christ means eternal life too. So let them bring in their fir tree. Let them decorate it. And then we'll all pray under it to the good Lord as the true giver of all abundance. Listen, I think I hear them coming with the tree now. From tent to tent, from one German tribe to another, the Yule tree and holly turned into the Christmas tree and the Christmas holly. But not all Germanic tribes had the same tradition. <laughs> 